All right, gang, it's Thursday, so you listen to the Steve Austin Show Unleashed podcast, and you know what that means. It means I done took my Onnit Alpha Brain and got a cup of coffee in me, and I'm ready to rock and roll. Hey, Onnit makes Alpha Brain, and they also make the greatest supplements on planet Earth, and they're giving all the Steve Austin podcast fans 10% off any order. Just go to Onnit.com slash Steve, and that's also going to include Shroom Tech Sport and T+. Now, Shroom Tech Sport will give you workouts a boost. It'll help you go longer and recover faster, and it's made with natural ingredients. It ain't loaded up with a bunch of artificial stimulants. You don't need that. And T-Plus increases strength and power. It'll improve your athletic performance, and it's safe to use if you're competing. So, go take advantage of the 10% discount off your order. Just go to onnit.com slash steve. And another great thing about Onnit and all their products is, if they don't work the way they're supposed to, you can get all your money back, no questions asked. Money back guarantee. So go to onnit.com slash Steve to get your 10% discount off all your supplements. That's O-N-N-I-T dot com slash Steve to get 10% off your order. The following program is a Podcast One dot com production. He started in a small town in Texas. Worked his ass off to become one of the most famous wrestlers of all time. We're going to take care of business tonight, and that's the bottom line. And now he's dominating the world of on-demand audio. And he's doing it for the working man. This is a damn good outlet for me to spew the bullshit off my brain. This is the Steve Austin Show. Unleashed. 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 All right, everybody, welcome to the Steve Austin Show. I am coming to you from Mago Dulce, California, out here on the set of Broken Skull Challenge. Today was Skull Buster Day, and it means I got to finish a little bit earlier than usual. It gave me a chance to conduct a rare interview because of my scheduling out here on the ranch, filming a show, the baddest, toughest, coolest show on television for country music television. So anyway, we're down here laying it down. Got badass contestants coming out here. All week long, next week, that week, next week after that, it keeps on going. The sun is high in the sky. It's always hot. It's like working in a sandblaster. And I'm having a blast. I'm having a time of my life. And the athletes that have come out here so far have really been putting on a show and just taking it to a whole nother level. So I'm real happy that I got a chance to take a break. And instead of just doing a one-man show from here in the trailer, I'm going to be talking to a man named Dale Wilkes, who wrestled as the Patriot. And uh, way back in the day, Dale got himself into uh, a little bit of trouble with uh, respect to prescription drugs and some other things. I'm about to have an unleashed conversation with Dale. Now, due to the fact that Dale is a religious man and a man of God, this is the Unleashed podcast. But uh, to respect him and so that friends and uh, relatives of his can listen to the show and not be offended by my language, I won't cuss during this interview, but I will ask Dell a lot of hard-hitting questions, and I know he will be very frank and honest with me because he said he wanted transparency, and he, that's what he's going to give me is transparency. So we're going to talk about the high times and the low times and in-between times of life in the business of pro wrestling, all of his football accolades, and everything else that goes along with that. I heard Dell way back in the day was taking, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 pills a day and ends up, it turns out, being way more than that. So I'm not going to leave any more of it to what I heard. I'm going to leave it to what I hear from the man himself. Dell Wilkes, the Patriot, is the conversation of the day. I'm talking to him very shortly. Just reached out with him on the telephone and got everything set up on extremely short notice. So I want to say thank you very much to Dell. And by the way, let me give you a little heads up for Dell Wilkes. Dell Wilkes is a pretty old school guy. He's a little bit older than I am. He's got me by a couple of years. I'm right in there behind him and hasn't embraced the age of technology uh, quite as well as I have. And y'all know how off speed I am with regards to technology. But the man does have a social media account now. He is on Twitter. So if you want to follow the Patriot Dell Wilkes on Twitter, he is at Dell Wilkes, D-E-L-W-I-L-K-E-S, Dell Wilkes on Twitter. And uh, I'll tell you what I'm going to do right now. I got my system right here, my laptop computer, all rednecked out. I got it Bluetooth to the uh, Bose speaker right here, and I'm going to play you the trailer 
the Dell, the Patriot Wilkes, Man Behind the Mask trailer. And this is a documentary they're uh, working on right now about Dell's life in the business of wrestling coming out of football and, you know, the trials and tribulations he went through and then the story of his redemption. And this is a trailer, and it's one of the reasons I was highly intrigued to talk to Dell because I always got along with Dell. For some reason, we didn't hang out together, but there was just a mutual respect. And so I'm glad that he's doing well. I'm going to hit the play button. Here's the trailer from Man Behind the Mask. All you got to do is hear it. You ain't got to see it. But if you want to go on YouTube, type in Dell the Patriot Wilkes, the Man Behind the Mask trailer. Here it goes. I never dreamed I would live such an amazing life. Coming from a small town in South Carolina, playing four years at the University of South Carolina was the thrill of my life. A Cinderella college football team of 1984, they've won eight straight. Coming from behind with a 25 fourth quarter outburst last week. Being a Gamecock and becoming an All-American is something that I take great pride in. Who knew when football ended that my journey would continue when I put on a mask? Wrestling became my life as I traveled the globe, representing the red, white, and blue. The Patriot, the Patriot rising to the skies. But along my path, things got out of control, and my life was on the wrong path. This is the story of me, Dell Wilkes, my dreams, my success, my failures, and my redemption. This is my life behind the mask. All right, now that documentary is going to be coming soon. I think uh, when I talk to Dell, I think uh, they just need a, a couple more bucks on a Kickstarter fund to help finish up this uh, project. And so since Dell is new to Twitter, we're going to get him to tweet out that link uh, for the Kickstarter fund. I'll retweet it. If you guys want to chip in, I'm going to chip in myself, as a matter of fact. But anyway, I'm looking forward to talking to Dell Wilkes, and uh, it's going to be a good conversation. Again, I'm going to hold my language down out of respect for the fact, uh, just the same way when I talk to Shawn Michaels, uh, held back the four-letter words. This is the Unleashed Show, but I think you're going to get your money's worth just because I think Dell's story is so interesting. Uh, and the guy has been through so much and overcome so much from uh, beating the living hell out of his body in uh, the football arena to the pro wrestling arena. And now with all the things, the surgeries that he's had done, has come out on the other side and uh, found his strength in the Lord. And that started back as a kid and now really as a serious commitment these days as a full-grown man, as an adult. I look forward to talking to him. But anyway, Dale Wilkes coming up. I'm going to go ahead and get on with my business. Again, I'm out here in my trailer. I got all the air conditioners turned off except the one in the back. I want this to be as good a recording as I can make for Dale so I can represent him and his cause to the highest degree. Uh, things go uh, continue to go well out here. We're having a blast. I'm about to get my work out in when I get done talking to Dell. Had a good day on the bench press yesterday. If y'all saw that video I tweeted out yesterday, I named my Kawasaki mule Buck after Buck Owens. If y'all didn't hear the Tuesday podcast, old Buck is the mule out there waiting on me. When I get done working out, I want to get my cardio in. I'm going to take old Buck for a ride. And then there's a restaurant way down the road about five, six, seven miles from here. And I'm out in the middle of nowhere, and it's supposed to be somewhat, somewhat of a uh, uh, world-class restaurant with elk and venison and all kinds of stuff on the menu. So I'm going to go down there and uh, have me a, a decent meal. I've been eating turkey patties and rice ever since I've been out here. I think I owe myself a little bit of a treat. But anyway, before I get to me and my treat, i got to get my workout, take my Kawasaki mule on a ride, uh, talk to Dale Wilkes, and before I talk to Dale Wilkes, before we get to the body of this podcast, let me tell you how you can make some great extra money. Become an Uber driver. Uber is that popular smartphone app that connects riders with drivers. I've used Uber before, and the drivers who have given me rides all have great stories to tell about loving their gig and the money that they're making. And they all say that they also love being their own boss, and they love setting their own hours. They can drive when they want for how long they want each time. And it's easy to start driving for Uber. You just need a car and a license. Now, driving for Uber is a great option for parents. You can work around your family's busy schedule, and it's a great option for students. You can make some extra cash in between classes. 
Driving with Uber is actually a great option for anyone who wants to make money, and now's the time to cash in driving with Uber. You'll thank me for telling you how to get paid every week, and you never know. I could be the one getting in your car when you drive with Uber. So, I know you got a car. I know you got a license. Put them to work. Start earning serious life-changing ducats today. Sign up to drive with Uber. Visit drivewithuber.com. That's drivewithuber.com. Let me spell it out for you. Drive with UBER.com. Thanks for making the big podcast with Shaq the number one sports podcast on Podcast One and iTunes. He is comedian Frank Caliendo. I wanted to be like a Sports Center anchor. Chris Berman. Right. Uh, you know, uh, we. My take on him is this is that he wants everything to be okay. The entire studio could be on fire, and he'd be like, you know, I. I know that you see <laughs> the studio engulfed in flames, but the G man, eh, yeah. <laughs> and it's become where he's not even an impressed. It's just Morse code. <laughs> <laughs> the big podcast with Shaq. That's me. It's up right now at podcast one dot com. That's podcast o n e dot com. All right, here we go. I'm sitting here on the telephone, on the Skype line. I'm talking to Dale Wilkes, who's down there in South Carolina. And y'all know me. I love to do my interviews in person. But sometimes that just ain't always the case because of location. Nonetheless, I'm talking to one and only Dale Wilkes, who used to be known as the Patriot. And in my open, I referenced, uh, you know, basically in the open, I played a trailer to The Man Behind the Mask. It's going to be a documentary on Dale Wilkes. Uh, but before I get into my conversation with Dell and welcome him to the show, I also want to point out one other thing on YouTube. If you get on YouTube and you type in Dell Wilkes testimony 06-15-2014, you'll hear Dell give a long story short about his trials and tribulations as he does a testimony inside a church. Uh, it's just uh, essential listening, and there's many interviews you'll find on Dell. And I listened to a few of those interviews as my time permitted. And we're going to kind of go between the lines of those and create our own conversation. Nonetheless, I won't be cussing with Dell on the uh, phone with respect uh, to, uh, to his religious beliefs, but I will be asking him hard hitting questions. And I asked Dell, I said, hey man, is everything uh, up for grabs here? And he goes, Steve, I just want to be transparent, share my story, and try to help uh, people avoid some of the mistakes and pitfalls that I made. With that being said, Hey, Dell, it's good to be talking to you. How are you today? I'm doing good, Steve. It's good to be talking to you. It's been a long time. Man, it has been a long time. When's the last time we saw each other? Was it the, was it the late 90s? Yeah, it was. It, it had to be sometime in late 97 uh, when we were both working for Vince. And um, to my knowledge, that's the last time we actually saw each other. Now, um its memory serves me. I, you know, after I got hurt and, and could no longer go back out on the road, uh, I got a phone call from you just uh, wishing me well and actually recommending Dr. Andrews to me. So I think that was the last conversation I had with you. But that was late 97, maybe early 98. Man, let's jump right into the thick of things, Dale, because you hear so many things, you know, when you get out of the business. And, uh, you know, I've watched so many of your interviews. You talked about uh, how many of the the guys that you and I both knew, and you could count maybe 40, 50 of them, even more, of guys that met their demise, you know, just a little bit heavy duty on the pills, a uh, combination of being a rock star, which you alluded to in some of your interviews uh, and so the fact that uh, we're both uh, still sitting here and able to talk about it, but uh, when I got the word on the street, you had hit a real bad place, and I said, man, some Dale was taking 40 or 50 painkillers a day, and I'm thinking, holy smokes, that's an incredible amount, but Dale, according to the interviews I've been listening to, you were taking double that amount. You, you said in one interview you were taking up to 120 pills a day. Now, is that a straight-up shoot? Yeah, that's a straight up shoot. And Steve, the amazing thing about it, that was just the pain pills. That did not count the somas, the Xanax, the Halcyon, the Valium. I would take at night to try to knock myself out because I think anyone that's had any experience with addiction to pain medication knows that it actually acts as as something that gives you energy. It really makes you going. It makes you wide open. It just gives you an enormous amount of energy. And uh, so at night, to be able to sleep, I had to knock myself out with any number of other pills that I could get my hands on or, or throw down my throat. But those 120, that was just the pain pills. That wasn't the other pills combined with it. I would take... 
I would take 15 to 20 pain pills at a time and chew them up and wash them down. I would just chew them up and get them in a powder form where they would take effect a lot quicker. But, uh, yeah, I was doing 120 of those a day. Okay, now you ride down the road, uh, and you were talking to Kurt Henning, and you had a bum elbow the size of a grapefruit, and you were talking about, man, it's hard to work with this thing. And Kurt asked you, what are you taking? And you said, well, a couple of goodies, you know, that old powdered aspirin type thing. And he kind of laughed at you. And then uh, so he smartened you up. Well, he enlightened you to the fact that there was pain pills that were prescription grade, you know, Vicodin, Percocet, uh, stuff like that. And so that, that was a start, and you took a couple of pain pills to get you down the road. How in the world, Dale, did, did it turn into the number that you ended up taking? Because, Dale, I was more, and let me talk about myself here for a second, I was more of a uh, hung with the drinking crowd. I had my Vicodin, mm-hmm. had a couple of perks. Uh, I'd take you know two Vikes with a cup of coffee to get up in the morning, and and uh, I was like a light switch. I had to turn on, and then I had to use something to turn off, and that's a straight up shoot. That's the way I was, but I didn't get deep into the pills. Although I took my share, I was that whiskey guy. When you're drinking about a fifth of whiskey every single night, you can go to sleep with about that thirty milligrams of Ambien. I ain't recommending it to nobody, but that's the that's the road I was going on. When I hear you dropping fifteen Vikes of perks at a time. Dude, how does that light you up? What does it make you feel like? Well, euphoric, happy. You know, I was under the impression before Kurt smartened me up, and and I've shared this uh, in my testimony and, and in my story, that I was under the impression that if I took any type of pain medication that it would make me goofy, it would make me droggy, it would make me want to fall asleep, but it did the exact opposite to me. It was like rocket fuel, man, and it lit me up, and I was wide open. And those first two that I took, innocently enough, the night Kurt gave them to me just to be able to get through a match, just to be able to work and to do what I was paid to do at the level that I needed to do it at. It took a while, but it eventually led to, you know, 15, 20 at a time. And you build a tolerance up to those things. And um, it just continued for me. It just got where two wasn't enough, and then four at a time wasn't enough, and six wasn't enough. And, you know, if if I didn't have what I felt I needed, and I had to bomb some from somebody. I, I took it as an insult if they could only give me five or six because I knew that wasn't near enough to get me through and, and to allow me to to do what I needed to do. And here's the thing: going back, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm just kind of smiling about the situation because back in the day, and I'm, I'm speaking for the crowd or or, or, or myself. I'm speaking to a, a, a circle of guys that I hung with. I don't want to uh, paint everybody with the same brush, but. Uh, for the guys that, that were using pain pills, you know, there you always wanted to help a brother out, but by the same token, you had to, to maintain control of your stash because that was what you had, you know, for yourself. So when all of a sudden you you, know, you got one of those guys like you, uh, hey man, you know, five or six here, five or six there, five or six, you know, down the road, it's kind of like, oh come on, man, and you know, you could hear a guy throw his backpack or, or his fanny pack on, and you could you could you could tell Dell, and I'm sure you could back me on this, you could tell by the rattle of the pills in that bag of what he was carrying. Could you not? Oh, absolutely. That was, I mean, you you get a trained ear. You, I mean, you, you're like a bird dog. You know how a bird dog pops his head up and that tail pops up? I mean, you hear that rattle and you know, you know who's carrying and who's not. And uh, the one thing I always made sure of, and it was more important to me than my boots or my mask or my tights, was that I had enough pills with me. And, um, and, and, and I had a buddy of mine that lived out in California and, He'd go across the water into Mexico, and you could buy the Somas and the Halcyons and the Valium and the Xanax. You could get those over the counter without a prescription. And then I was working the doctors uh, for the prescriptions to the pain pills and, and, and running from pharmacy to pharmacy here in Columbia before I would hit the road. But uh, listen, I'd much rather have left the house without my trunks and my boots and the left without my medicine bag. <laughs> And there, there, there was a lot of guys muling stuff over from Mexico or wherever they were coming from. But man, when, when I think about the number of pills that you're taking, and then uh, you know, obviously you, you, you learned how to basically be a doctor. You spoke the language, and you started writing your own pres- uh, prescriptions, pretty much, right? Yeah, I did. Uh, there was a a doctor that I think we were all, uh, you know, we all had in common. A doctor that we're all uh, familiar with, and. Um, 
I had uh, gone to visit him on several occasions in his office, in his home, and I had sat there and listened as he would call prescriptions in for the boys. I'd sit right there in his office, and, and, you know, the boys would call in time and time and time again, and I just got that cadence. I got that language. I learned to say what needed to be said, and I learned that if I got a doctor's DEA number, which is basically his, like his Social Security number, right. that's what identifies that doctor to a pharmacist, then um, if I could get a doctor's DEA number, I knew what to say. And I uh, once the doctor started cutting me off, then uh, I became my own doctor, and I started calling these things in. And, I mean, I did it for years. Okay, you did it for years. Now, here's the thing. Uh, and you're not getting us off the black market. you still got to pay for these pills. So, man, how much a week or a month are, are you spending on pain pills and everything else that you can't mule in? Well, it was costing me back then. It would cost me about, to get 90 of them would cost me about 60 bucks. Uh, and I was doing that. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the doctors that, that I'm referring to, uh, I would pay him uh, $1,000 a month, and every Monday he would FedEx out uh, a package. And in it, uh, I would have 150 Somas, 150 Xanax, 150 Halcyons, and then he would write me six different prescriptions for 100 uh, Vicodin. And he would FedEx out that FedEx that out to me every Monday, and he was part of my budget. That was like my mortgage, my car right. payment, my electricity payment, my doctor payment, and uh, and so I was getting them that way. And then once he cut me off, then I became the doctor, and I just started calling them in myself. But I spent a fortune, uh, an absolute fortune, on on pills and, and Vicodin and Percocet and Halcyons and Somas and all that stuff. Hey, well, when you went to the pharmacy to pick his stuff up, I mean, did the farmers kind of like give you that look like, what is going on here? How are you doing this? Are you the one taking all this stuff? Or were you rotating pharmacies just like you sometimes rotated docs back in the day? Yeah, I was rotating pharmacies. Once I got out of the business, and, and, and I had to because of the reoccurring injury, and uh, it, it became a full-time job for me. It became a full-time job from the moment I woke up to the time I went to sleep at night. I was calling scripts in. I was working pharmacies, and not only pharmacies in Columbia, but I branched out. I was going to Greenville, South Carolina, Sumter, South Carolina, uh, you know, about a 40-, 50-mile radius uh outside of Columbia, and uh, it literally, I mean, it became my full-time job because here's the thing about it, see, if I don't get these pain pills, you know, this is, uh, pain pills are an opiate. They're just like heroin. Right. They come from the same plant that heroin comes from, and if I don't get these pain pills, it's the awful, it's the worst kind of dope sickness you can imagine. The shakes, the sweats, uh, the tremors, uh, your muscles cramp, they ache, you have no energy, and uh, I can honestly say, you know, my background in football, my background in wrestling, there's been very little that's ever intimidated me. But that dope sickness intimidated me. I mean, it just absolutely made a coward out of me. And, and there was no way that I could deal with it. There was no way I could face it. So uh, I would spend my entire day just, I mean, just hunting pills, calling pills in. I'd sit in my car on my cell phone. I'd call them in, and then I would immediately run inside. And I would watch the reaction of the pharmacist to see if he acted suspicious, if he said anything to any of the pharmacy techs around him, like, hmm, just got a suspicious call. Maybe I better call the doctor back to see if this is correct. And I'd just sort of, you know, wander around the pharmacy for about 20 or 30 minutes to make sure that everything seemed to be cool with the pharmacist. And then I would go back in after a while and pick that prescription up. Man, I tell you, that's incredible. Now, here's the thing. Okay, you got the pain pills going. And 15, 20 at a time, and uh, probably, and that's, what, six, eight times a day you're eating that amount? Oh, yeah, easily. Easily. Okay. So there, with respect to the somas, and somas, uh, to people who don't know, uh, soma means sleep. And, and for the boys, they were a muscle relaxer, and they were very popular. I don't know about today's landscape, but back in the day they were. And kind of a ragged drug, and, you know, uh, it, just kind of a short ride. But you could take a little bit of a cat nap on it, and anyway, I won't get into the the intricacies of that. But, dude, what kind of amounts of somas were you downing? 
Well, I could I could take twenty or thirty somas in the course of a night, and like you said, they they didn't they would hit you quick and they were gone quick, and uh, but I could go through twenty or thirty somas a night, and uh, I had a couple of friend friends of mine that had had uh, uh, one of them had been in a car accident and, and was left mangled up pretty good, and another one had some back problems, and uh, they were getting tons of somas and they would just pedal them off to me, and uh, so that was my source for somas. But I could very easily go through 20, 30 songs a night. Dale, come on again. That's an astounding number, man. I mean, five would have been my max. And now you're, you're shooting straight up with me, right? Oh, absolutely. As God is my witness, dude. I'm not, I mean, I'm not dude, exactly you're lucky to be a, straight you're, up shoot. You're lucky to be alive. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. My uh, my wife at the time, on, on more than one occasion, uh, found me unresponsive, uh, laying in the floor, just you know, shaking and jerking and, and had to be taken to the emergency room, call an ambulance, call 911, he's dying, he's not responding to me. And uh, I went through that on, on several occasions. So, yeah, you're, you're exactly right. I'm, I'm very fortunate that I'm not one of those guys that I've talked about that you and I knew well that, that did not make it. And, uh, you know, it's just the grace of God that I, I didn't become a casualty. And I tell you what, we used to call it the Soma Shakes because once you kind of cross over that threshold, that's why you, you turn into that jelly state and you just sit there and start trembling. And then again, a lot of guys were combining those with the Vicodin. That, that wasn't a good ride for me. I didn't go that route. I'm sitting here having a very open, frank, candid conversation with Dale Wilkes. Don't try anything we're talking about. We're just talking about his past and how he got through this. It's just incredible to me because I was in that culture for so long. And like I said, I wasn't heavy into it, but I certainly took my share. I was that drinking guy. Uh, well, with respect to the Xanax and the Halcyon, uh, Dale, how many of those were you eating today? I could. Uh, there have been nights I've gone through those uh, those sticks, those bars, those Xanax. Two milligram bars. Uh, yeah, I've done six to eight of those uh, a night, and um, I'm telling you, man, it is amazing, Steve. I don't know if if I'm horse like or, or animal like, but I built up an unbelievable tolerance to that stuff and just could take tons of it. I can recall night after night after night, especially when I worked in Japan. And, uh, you know, I've taken four sticks, I've taken five sticks, and I still can't sleep. And I've drinking, I've, I've, I've gone through every beer in that refrigerator, and I still can't sleep. So I'd end up doing six, eight sticks a night. So, okay, when you finally were able to get to sleep, and I've, I've just been a notorious sleeper my entire life, and, but when I was in the business, you know, uh, 30 milligrams Ambien or, or, you know, a handful of Somas and a couple of Xanax, I mean, that was my go-to thing. If I ran out of one, I'd try to, uh, you know, use the other, try to get me through. Uh, how, how many hours did you sleep a night? Because it doesn't sound like you slept a whole lot. I didn't sleep a whole lot, and then you know you, you're up early the next morning, and it's not been good sleep. It's been drug induced sleep, and you're you're basically hung over. And then that's where the handful of you know Vicodin come in because again that serves. That's right. It, 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 that's what gets me going. That's what wakes me up. That's what makes me alert. That's what I know when I chew them up and I wash them down with a cup of coffee or, or whatever I wash them down with. Give me about fifteen minutes, brother, and I'm going to be ready to take on the world. Okay, now you you mentioned a couple of beers. Uh, now, how bad off were you with alcohol or, or drinking? Was the pills your main vice? Yeah, I, you know, I, I drank like like a lot of the guys that we worked with and a lot of guys in our business. But when I was heavy on the pills, I wouldn't drink a lot because I didn't want anything to interfere with that pain pill, bud. Right. That, ha that happy, euphoric feeling, yep. I didn't want anything to mess with that. I didn't want to eat. I didn't want to drink. I just wanted to ride that thing out because that was just a – it was – and then you mentioned it earlier. It was the breakfast of champions. What a better way to wake up. Then chew up a bunch of pills and, 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 you know, throw down a cup of coffee and 20 minutes later, man, I mean, you're just tearing everything up. You're ready to go. Man, what about, uh, you know, with respect to, uh, finally, you know, it, it was the body, it was the bodybuilding world that turned the wrestlers on to the GHB and all of a sudden, you know, it was supposed to be a little bit of a fat burner, quote unquote, back in the day. Well, the boys got a hold of it. It was a way to get high and get a real kind of happy, mellow buzz. Were you ever into the GHB? I, I did get into it after I got out of the business. This was around 2000, maybe 2001. Uh, I started dating a girl that, that was a bodybuilder. Uh, it was a relationship that didn't last very long, but she introduced me to the GHB. And, uh, of course, again, 
just like the pain pills, just like the Somas and the Xanax and the Valium. I just couldn't do a bottle cap, you know. I mean, yeah. I had to do it much of it until I woke up the next morning and my house was rearranged and my tennis shoes were in my refrigerator and, you know, my pots and pans were in the bathtub and stupid stuff like that would happen. God dang, Dell. Okay, last question about just, just as far as the variety. Okay, here and there, a little bit of cocaine. Did you ever delve into that stuff? Heavily. I sure did. Um, and, you know, uh, man, uh, again, I messed with it the entire time I was in the business. I would pick my nights when I would really go on a, you know, a, a bender, so to speak. But uh, when I would come home, and, and especially when I worked for Baba uh, in all Japan, because, you know, I'd go over for three weeks and you'd come home and you'd have two weeks off, 17 days off, and uh, got a good friend of mine a real close friend of mine that owned a, a bar here in Columbia, and he still owns it. And I'd go see him, and, you know, I'd get out there at 9 or 10 o'clock at night, and I don't go home till 12 o'clock the next day because, you know, I'm powdered up, and I've gone through an eight ball of Coke, and and uh, if not more. So, yeah, I, I did the same thing with that as well. All right, gang, let's take a quick minute here to talk about my buddy Diamond Dallas Page and his DDP Yoga. You see, DDP created and developed DDP Yoga for people like himself who need a proven, low-impact workout that will get results. And thousands of people who are already doing DDP Yoga will tell you it definitely gets results. DDP Yoga is not traditional yoga. It's actually a cardio workout that's easier on your joints. And low-impact is a good thing. Ain't no running or lifting with DDP Yoga. But this program will build strength and flexibility, and it will burn fat. And... DDP Yoga is designed to help people of all ages and all skill levels. DDP has got pro wrestlers, MMA fighters, pro football players, and thousands of regular everyday people living a better, healthier life thanks to his DDP Yoga program. You can do DDP Yoga anywhere, too. You don't need a gym. You don't need a yoga studio. All the workouts are available on MP3, so you can do it at home, on the road, at work, wherever you are. Because you listen to the Steve Austin Show, DDP is giving all y'all a great deal on the Max Pack, and all you have to do is go to ddpyoga.com slash Austin. Hey, listen up to what you get when you order the Max Pack. You're going to get 15 workouts. You're going to get a nutrition guide. You're going to get recipes. You're going to get a grid chart to track your workouts, and you get a poster to help you remember the 12 core positions to make up DDP Yoga. Gang, take advantage of this special deal. Go to ddpyoga.com slash Austin. That's ddpyoga.com slash Austin. Hey, live a healthier lifestyle. He's giving you all the tools to do it. ddpyoga.com slash Austin. Yuvia needed financing to grow her restaurant business, but her bank simply didn't understand. I was frustrated. Yuvia found on-deck business loans. On-deck did it for me. I called on Saturday, and I had $50,000 in my account on Monday morning. How about the terms? Incredibly easy. It doesn't mess with your cash flow. On-deck changed everything. This company, on-deck, is going to be there for me. Was it a good move? I'm looking to increase sales probably 30%. Been in business for at least a year with $100,000 plus in revenue? On Deck can get you $5,000 to $250,000 in as little as one business day. And they're A-plus rated with the Better Business Bureau. On Deck has opened up so many doors for me now. Truly, truly, the sky is the limit. I, I'm excited. Apply now at ondeck.com slash Steve or call 800-206-7036. 800-206-7036. 800-206-7036. Loan subject to lender approval. Steve Austin. Steve Austin. Unleashed. Unleashed. Now, Dell, here's the thing that, that really baffles me about you, because you and I didn't know each other real well, but I just always had a, a, a respect for you. I guess it was probably recipro re reciprocal. Uh, but you were a hell of a chameleon because you were a guy that I just kind of looked at. I, I knew you were a hellacious football player back in the day uh, for South Carolina, but I figured you to be a pretty much just kind of a straight shooter and not on anything. How did you mask it as well as you did? Because you had me fooled. Well, I think I have everybody fooled. And, and to your point uh, about reciprocating the respect, absolutely. I've always had nothing but the utmost respect for you. But I did. I kayfabed everybody on that, Steve. It was just uh, that was my deal. Uh, to give you an example, when I worked in Japan, 
my best friend that I've probably ever had in the business was Doug Furness. Doug and I were, wow. were like brothers and just a great guy and just a straight up good guy. And we would eat together every night. We would train together every day. And, uh, you know, Doug didn't drink. And I would always wait till Doug left my room. We always ate in my room, no matter what city we were in, what hotel we were in. Doug would always come down to my room and we'd eat or maybe we'd go out and get something. But after Doug left, that's when I'd close the door, right. and that's when I'd start drinking. That's when I'd start throwing down the pills. And those guys there didn't know either. I, I, I hid it from everybody. Man, so then you, you started off using the pain pills, you know, just to, to so you could work, so you get a paycheck, so you could pay your bills, take care of your family. Uh, but then all of a sudden, it turns into this massive addiction. How is that? I mean, uh, what's that life like? I mean, because, dude, I always tell people, as a professional wrestler, you kind of live in three lives in one body. On one, you're a professional-grade athlete because you're training heavy in the gym. You're working hard, high intensity every night. Then you're a rock star. You know about the rock star part because uh, of all the things that you were doing, and everybody wanted to be around you, touch you, but you, you had the access to all the chemicals we've just been talking about. Then on the other side of that, Dell, you're also a truck driver because you're driving yourself to the majority of the shots you make unless you go to Japan. So... Uh, here you are living three lives in one body, and all of a sudden you're, you, you turned yourself into someone who just wanted to get by into a flat-out addict. Uh, it was just, just, and this just became the norm for you. It was nothing but a thing. And your wife at the time, I mean, I would, I would imagine that this pretty much drove her crazy. Oh, it did. It, it did, and it, it led to our marriage ending. And I'll, uh, I'll give you an example. And this is a story that happened one day. She was. Um, Taking me to the airport, I was uh, going to catch a flight out of Columbia. I was heading to Tokyo um, uh, for about a three-week tour. So I had got up that morning. I had been out all night the night before. That was my customary thing. The night before I uh, leave, I'm going to go out with my buddy. I'm going to go out to his bar, and I'm going to drink all night and get coked up. And then when I get on the plane, I can take a handful of uh, somas or halcyons, and I'll sleep the entire flight. Right. And um, so I'd been out all night, and... Uh, Got up running late, and uh, I've got to run to six or seven pharmacies to get my pain pills. My uh, Somas, my Xanax, my Halcyon had all been delivered the day before through FedEx. And for some reason, I wasn't afraid, Steve, to carry all these prescription pills with me into Japan. It never intimidated me. It never I felt never felt threatened when I going through customs because everything was in prescription labeled bottles. But I would never take my testosterone, my Diana Ball, whatever right. I was taking. So here we're going down the interstate. I've had her run me to six or seven different pharmacies. We're running late. I'm yelling at her, you're not driving fast enough. So I load up a syringe full of testosterone, three cc's. I drop my pants. I'm sitting in the, dry, in the passenger seat. And um, I hit my left butt cheek with that uh, inch and a half needle and uh, hit that plunger and drop three cc's of testosterone in my in my left butt cheek, and I guess I hit a vessel, so when I pulled the needle out, yeah. it rooster-tailed blood across the car, and it literally hit her on the right cheek. And uh, she just hit the shoulder of the road and just put the brakes on real fast. And she just looked at me. She said, this is insane. I can't take this. She goes, look how we're living. She goes, nobody lives this way. And I just looked at her, and I thought, God, I mean, what's wrong with you? You must be having a bad day. I mean, this was normal for me. This was, you know, I mean, or is it that time of the month for you? Is that is that what your problem is? You know, and, and looking back on it now, it was insane. It was crazy. But that was just the way I was living at the time. And at that time, what was abnormal seemed normal for me. Your your reality was pretty far out. I mean, but but it's incredible once you get in that mindset, you almost assume. And again, I wasn't as far down that road as you were, but I, I, you know, back when I was on the road and I was doing my thing, I thought, hey, it's perfect and normal to drink a fifth of whiskey every single night after the matches, and a little bit more on the weekends when it didn't happen to be working. So it's just another day at the office for you. And then so then, why isn't everybody doing? Or what's so wrong with it? Uh, you brought up the uh, you brought up the steroids and. It one of your interviews you're talking about hey you're making a living you ain't got a shirt on uh and you know that that appearance is you know it's part of the marquee 
but also it's the recovery powers. It's the, the ability to weather through the storms along with the pain and try to keep your body in one piece. Uh, you started using a little bit of gas in your collegiate days, no? I did. Um, I, I, um, I guess it was my sophomore year at Carolina. We were playing the University of Georgia, and, and, and I – I was trying to do things the natural way, and I was an undersized, six foot three, two hundred and forty pound uh, offensive guard at a major major college football program. And I'm playing against a guy that's a senior, and he's jacked up, and he's gassed up, and he's about three bills, and he just humiliates me that day. I mean, he just absolutely beat me and right. threw me around and embarrassed me. And I was determined after that day that I would do whatever it took that that would never ever ever happened to me again i'd take whatever i had to take i'd shoot whatever i had to shoot but i would never be embarrassed like that guy embarrassed me that day as a matter of fact the following monday at practice my head coach stood me up in front of the entire team and told me what an embarrassment i was that day and that i'd let my team down the way i played and oh. i determined then i'd never let them down again i'd never be embarrassed like that again and i'd do whatever i had to do to prevent that from happening and um I actually contacted a team doctor, and uh, of course back then there was no drug testing, there were no rules against steroids, it was very prevalent in college football, and I contacted a, a team doctor, and he uh, he wrote me a prescription for Diana Ball, and off I went. I knew you were going to say that, but I was just a few years behind you, Dale, I think you're right at the 53 mark, I'm 50, I remember playing Juco Ball and a couple of the guys, you know, it was the little blue D-balls, and no one was injecting back then, a couple of guys on the team started off with the Diana Balls, and man, I tell you what, those guys started growing, they started bench pressing more. Dude, you turn into an all-world football player at South Carolina, uh, All-America. Uh, didn't you clear some holes up for George Rogers? What, was that your freshman year? It was my freshman year. I was uh, I was fortunate. I came in as a true freshman and, and was a backup to a, to a senior. But uh, because of injuries that he had uh, sustained, I got to play a good bit and block for George a good bit. So, uh that was quite uh, that was quite the pleasure, man. Playing for a stud running back like George Rogers, one of the greatest running backs in college football history, the probably the greatest gamecock that's ever played down here. But uh, yeah, to have the opportunity to block for a Heisman Trophy went over something special. So, and I was a big George Rogers fan back in the day, you know. And I actually got some recruiting letters from South Carolina. Now they weren't serious; those those ones that kind of throw out to anybody that's turning any kind of heads anywhere. Uh, but I always wanted to get a chance to go there. But obviously. It would didn't make the grade, hit the JUCO, ended up at North Texas State. But back to you with respect to the D-ball, uh, because you turned into an all-world football player. How much did the gas help you as a football player going into your junior and your senior years where you were All-American? Oh, there's, there's no doubt about it. It helps. Uh, I mean, you get um, – your recovery time is so much quicker. Uh, every day you go into the weight room, you're making gains, you're getting stronger. It, it, it's just, it, it blows you away. I mean, and I had gotten pretty strong uh, on my own without the, the help of anything. But um, once you you take what you can do naturally and you couple it with what the, the testosterone and the D-ball can do for you, uh, you're quicker, you're faster, you're more explosive. Uh, you know, and, and as a lineman, you know, we do we did things in just little small areas. So explosiveness was so important. Right. So to be able to just jack somebody up off the ball, you know, in a step or two was so important. And it allowed you to do that much, much better. Hey man, uh what was you, what were you bench pressing when you came out of college? I uh, when I was with I signed with the Atlanta Falcons uh, I signed with the Bucks in '85, and then I was with the Falcons in '86 in, in, in camp. But my best bench was—I uh, did five ten. Five ten is a hell of a bench, and obviously, I'm assuming that's raw because it was back in the day. Yeah, it. Um, we had to do our body weight as many times as we could, uh, and I weighed 285, and I did 285 27 times, and I did a single Ooh. for uh, five ten. Dude, 285, 27 times is astronomical. So let's talk about the NFL because, man, if you're probably the greatest lineman to ever come out of South Carolina, and with all due respect, 
a couple of cups of coffee and the NFL. What had happened? Were, were your knees already starting to bother you? Was the injuries that, that 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 happened? Because just by looking at the paper, I'm just thinking, man, this guy is going to be, uh, you know, a Hall of Famer in the NFL. What happened in the NFL? Well, I signed as a free agent with the Bucks uh, out of when you know when I got out of South Carolina. And uh, I got down there, and I just had a, a, a nagging injury that limited my playing time in right. camp. And of course, that's when you earn your, you know, that's when you earn your keep right there in camp, man. And that's when you turn heads and impress coaches, especially as a free agent. And that's, you know, that that playing time is so important. That film time is so important. And I just didn't have the opportunity to do that because of that injury, and it just kept me, uh, you know, on the sideline. And uh, so that limited me there. And um, and then I signed with the Falcons in '86, and in '86 it was just a situation where I was in the mix. I mean, the Atlanta Falcons had an unbelievable offensive line in '86. Right. They had Bill Fralick, they had Mike Ken, they had Jeff Van Note. Uh, they had some. I had some ball players, and it was just a. a a, a numbers game then, you know, it was just the fact that, hey, kids, you're a good ball player, but, uh, you know, we just don't have space for you and we don't have room for you. So they released me prior to the start of the uh, 86 season. Okay, so man, what were your plans right then? Because as a kid growing up, I mean, you're you're you had two things that you really wanted to do. You wanted to play football for South Carolina. You did that. You also were a big fan of the business of professional wrestling. So all of a sudden, football closes the doors on you. How long did it take you to to reset and say, okay, here's what I need to do. I need to go into professional wrestling. It didn't take long at all, and and, and I've always been one of those guys that when. One chapter of my life closes. I just close that book and move on. And I did that after I got out of the wrestling business. I just moved on. It was overdone, and I just, you know, detached myself from it and went on about my life. But I, I did the same thing with football. I, I had determined that I wasn't going to be one of these guys that would bounce around from camp to camp to camp to camp. And a matter of fact, um, the the players went on strike in '87. And uh, that's when they brought in the scabs, and I had several teams, the Dolphins, the Cowboys, the Broncos, several teams call me up and, and offer me a contract. And, of course, there were no guarantees. I mean, if the strike lasts two weeks, and you may have two weeks of playing time. If it lasts six weeks, it could be six weeks. And so there was no guarantee there. And uh, I, uh, at that point in time, I determined that it was time for me to move on to put football in the rearview mirror. And uh, I came back to Columbia, and there was a school here in Columbia that trained uh, professional wrestlers. So I, I plopped my $1,800 down, and off to wrestling school I went. How long did it take you to pick up the business? Was it something that came easy to you, or was it a work in progress? It was a work in progress for me because the athletic part of it, I, I think I picked up pretty quick. I, I've always been blessed to you know, uh, be a pretty good athlete and have pretty good athletic ability. But the school I went through was uh, was owned by the fabulous Moolah, Lillian Ellison, yep. and it was it was mainly geared toward girls. Uh, at the time I got there, she she had some guys there that had been through her school, and she would occasionally send them up to events to work TV uh, matches. You know where they'd go out and put somebody over, and you know a minute, ninety seconds, something like that. So those guys didn't know a whole lot more than I did. They didn't know anything about psychology and selling and things like that. So. The athletic end of it, I picked up pretty quick, but the rest of it was a work in progress for me. So then was uh, AWA your first territory when they gave you the trooper gimmick? No, actually, the first territory I worked, Steve, I went to work for, um, I went to work over there Mid-South for uh, Jarrett, and, and when Jerry Lawler was there, and, and Randy Hale, yeah. uh, and I was just work, working as Bill Wilkes, and, and then they worked, <laughs> they put a... They put a hood on me, and, and, and for a few weeks I worked as the dream weaver. And, uh, and then they, uh, they put me and Scott Steiner together and put us under hoods, and we were the wrestling machines. We wore white hoods and, and white, uh, white tights. So that was my first territory that I worked was over there in Mid-South. So then when you consider the trooper, you know, a pretty good break for you? Because, dude, I remember watching AWA back in that day, and I saw you come out, you know, just uh, good physique, riding the tickets after you beat a guy. I love that gimmick. Was it good for you? Oh yeah, it was. That was my first big break. Um, yeah. You know, Wahoo was Wahoo was working for Vern, and, and Wahoo still had a permanent home in Charlotte, and he had come home to Charlotte for a few weeks, and Moolah booked him on one of her shows, 
And uh, so Wahoo came in and worked with us that night, and that's when I met Wahoo, and he really took a liking to me. And, and, and I think that football background that we had in common probably had a lot to do with that. And uh, he uh, he talked to me about coming up and working uh, working in the AWA and working that territory, and, and he went back up to Minneapolis, and then within a couple of weeks, Vern called me, and uh, I was uh, I was heading to Minneapolis. Hey man, I'm sitting here talking to Dell Wilkes. He just brought up the name Wahoo McDaniel's. I got to get a couple of Wahoo stories from Dell because I've heard so much about the man. He's one of my favorites from way back in the day when he'd come through Houston uh, wrestling for Paul Bosch and Ric Flair. He would tell you a million Wahoo McDaniel stories about how tough he was and how much he could drink. I'm gonna get a couple of stories from Dell before we move on and continue our conversation. Uh, I'm talking to Dell Wilkes. I'm taking pause for the calls. We're from Spot. Sponsors, and I'm coming right back with more with Dale Wilkes. I don't know a single person who doesn't have a cell phone these days. We can't live without them. Everywhere I go, people are looking down at their cell phones, texting, taking pictures, playing games, checking emails, shopping, doing everything on their phone but talking. And y'all know how I feel about people who use their cell phones while driving. Stop texting and pay attention to the road. But before I digress into things that piss me off about smartphones and how people are using them, let me tell you about a new smartphone app that will make your life easier and save you a boatload of money in the process. True Car. True Car is making good use of your cell phone. True Car has created a mobile app that makes buying a new car simple and fun. Download the True Car app, and in five minutes, you can create the car you want. You can choose make, model, special features, even the color. And once you have the specs filled out, you can see what others paid for the same car. And when I say others, I mean people who actually live in your zip code. Then you can lock in guaranteed savings from True Car certified dealers in your area, on average over $3,000 off MSRP. Now that's making good use of your cell phone. They got an app for everything these days, but how many actually save you a serious chunk of change? And imagine what you can do with that money. It's summertime, folks. I can think of lots of things you can do with an extra three grand in your pocket. So do the smart thing. Download the True Car app. Save time. Save money. And never overpay. Download the True Car app today. Dale, when we left off, we were talking about Wahoo McDaniels. And uh, he's one of my favorites of all time. Why do guys just take a liking to you? Was it just because uh, you're a quiet, humble guy with your eyes open and your mouth shut? I think that had a lot to do with it. Uh, I was a guy that was willing and warning to take advice and, and direction in my career. And uh, I, I just latched on to Wahoo. And then, you know, there was just this mutual admiration. I, I think that football background, yep. man, Wahoo was a heck of a football player at Oklahoma, uh, played, I think, about eight or nine years in the NFL. Yes, sir. And, you know, Wahoo, Wahoo was a big star with the New York Jets right before they signed Joe Namath. And uh, Wahoo was over like a million bucks up there. And uh, – but yeah, he did. He just took a liking to me, and he literally just took me under his wing, and and uh, for a long time there, wherever Wahoo went, wherever Wahoo got booked, he made sure that Dell was there. And uh, I'm telling you, a legitimate, legitimate tough guy. He was a guy. Stevie had a good heart about him. He had a gruff exterior. He had an explosive temper. He could be very, very volatile. He was as tough as nails. But the guy had a, a good heart about him, and, and he was always willing to give a young guy a break, to give a young guy advice, and to help a young wrestler out. And he did that for me, and I'll always, always be appreciative of Wahoo for doing that. Dill, what was one of the most important things that, that you would have learned from Wahoo McDaniels? Just because I'm just assuming uh, fire as, as a baby face uh, would, would be one of those things. Am I wrong? No, you're exactly right, and uh, that was one of the things that Wahoo taught me. And also, too, just you know, just to be a pro, going about your business and doing about doing your business the right way. I'll never forget. Uh, we were up in Ohio, mid Southern Ohio to Mid Ohio, and, and Wahoo knew a guy up there that, that ran some independent shows, and and, and uh, he booked us for about I think it was eight or nine shows over the course of two weeks. And the deal was the guy was going to pay us every night after the show. And uh, he did for the first couple of nights. And I guess after the second or third night, he came to Wahoo and said, look, you know, I, we're just not drawing anybody. We don't have any walk-up ticket sales. Things aren't going well. He goes, but the last night of this deal, he said, you know, we've already sold a bunch of tickets. He goes, it's going to be in my hometown. He said, would you be okay if I paid you guys then? 
instead of paying you every night after the show. So Wahoo came to me and he said, are you okay with it? And I said, Chief, if you're okay with it, I'm okay with it. I value your judgment and your opinion. And uh, so that night, we went the rest of the time and we didn't get paid. And that night, man, we were in a high school gymnasium, Steve, and that place was sold out. And right before the bell, this guy takes off, takes mm. off with the money. And we got a locker room full of guys that aren't going to get paid. And we had guys that were taking their gear off, getting ready to walk out. And Wahoo said, hey, look, he said, the first one of you that walks out of here, he said, I'll beat the snot out of you. He said, these people out here paid their hard-earned money to watch us, and we're going to go out there. And he said, we're going to do what they've paid to watch us do. And I had I had ridden up with him. I drove up to Charlotte and met him in Charlotte. And we jumped in his Bronco and rode up to Ohio. And that night after the show, he and I jumped in that Bronco, Steve, and he had a big old medicine bag in the back seat. And he pulled out one of them old film canisters, and it was full of cocaine. And he got tooted up, and I got tooted up. And we went to the guy's house. And Wahoo went to the front door with a pistol and started beating on the door. And, uh, of course, the guy wouldn't come out. But there he stood, the chief, with pistol in hand and liquored breath and uh, a nose full of cocaine, ready to get his money by any means necessary, but just that, you know, that toughness, too, yeah. that, uh, that Wahoo had. So, <laughs> so that, if I, I already, you know, uh, Chi, <laughs> Wahoo McDaniels is one of my favorite. The fact that you just said he drove a Ford Bronco puts him higher on my list as I have a Ford Bronco. What, what else did you learn from the guy? Well, he, uh, dependability, to right. be dependable, to be counted on. Uh, to show up, uh, no matter what happened the night before, and believe me, Wahoo was notorious for all-nighters. He was a double-fisted drinker. Uh, he could do his share of the powder as well, but it didn't matter how bad he felt the next day or the next afternoon. You know, he'd throw a couple of beanies down his throat, and, you know, he was bouncing off the walls, and you just went out there night after night after night, and, and you showed up and you delivered. Hey man, how was your? Uh, go, let's 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 skip into Japan real quick, uh, because how did you like working in Japan versus uh, what was going on in the states at the time? When you when you, when and and how did you get introduced to uh, all Japan wrestling? Who who was your in there? Jimmy Suzuki was my in there. I don't know if you know Jimmy or are familiar yeah. with him, uh, but Jimmy was was the guy that uh, got me hooked up with Baba, and. Um, I went over the first time, I think it was either in 89 or maybe 1990. I'm a little fuzzy on what year it was, but I went over and worked as a trooper. And uh, I can tell you, I wasn't prepared for it. I wasn't prepared for those type matches. Uh, they were snug. They were stiff. Uh, they were believable. They were. Uh, they had long finishes with just countless false finish after false finish after false finish. And yes. I just wasn't prepared for that. And it just, you know, it just blew me away. And I left there thinking, I, you know, I've blown my opportunity. I'll, I'll never be back. They'll never have me back. And as you very well know, uh, at that time, it was really uh, quite a feather in your cap uh, to be, to work for Bob or to have the opportunity to go to Japan. You know, it was a, uh, it was a very well-respected company and a very well-respected booker within the business. And I left there really with my tail tucked between my legs thinking, man, I've, I've blown it. I'll never be back. But about a year and a half later, uh, I got the opportunity to go back as the Patriot and work. And I was, I was much more prepared. Uh, I had more experience under my belt. I had more ring time. So I was much more, you know, suited for that style. And it and, and it worked out very well for what me. What did you and think about the strong? I'll, what did you think about the strong style uh, that they, that you were referring to when you first went over uh, as the trooper, and then when you came back as a patriot with a year and a half more experience under your belt, ready to deal with that? Because in, in watching, you know, watch some of your matches uh, in Japan uh, with the Eagle, your your tag team partner Jackie Fulton against uh, Doctor Death Steve Williams, and of course one of my all time favorites Terry Bam Bam Gordy. You know, you, you're snug. You, your stuff looks good, but I wouldn't consider it strong style. You're still taking care of her, brother. So what, did, what were your thoughts on the strong style? Well, I was fine with it. I, I think that football background and that football yep. mentality, you know, it, it, it's always with you. And if a guy's a little snug with you, if it, you know, if a guy, uh, you know, lays one on you, then, then I, you know, I was always like, okay, next, let's keep on going. And I never had a problem with it, and I enjoyed it. And uh, 
But that first time I went, I'm telling you, I watched a, a Crawford Furnace match with, uh, I think it may have been Kabashi and Kikuchi, and I'd never seen anything like that. It just blew me away. And uh, But when I went back, I was better prepared for it. And I tell you, Steve, I loved working over there. Uh, of all the years that I spent in the business and the different companies I worked for, uh, my most enjoyable time in the business, uh, my most favorite years that I guess that I spent in the business was, was the time I spent in Japan. And working with a phenomenal roster, when you think about the guys that I was with on the American bus, the Gaijin bus, Gordy, Williams, Hanson, Crawford, Furnace, Butcher, Dory Funk, Johnny Ace, and then you go over to that Japanese bus and you got Jumbo and Tawei and Kawada and Masawa and Kabashi. That's a pretty strong lineup, brother. Dude, that's pretty much a who's who on two buses. Yeah, it was it was phenomenal, and they were doing phenomenal business. And it was just uh, it was it was a great ride, and it was a pleasure being a part of it. Hey, man, uh, Terry Bam Bam Gordon left this world way too soon, and he was one of my favorites. Big bully type heel, I mean, but he's just an absolute sweetheart of a guy. Had his demons, but how fun was that to, to work with him and Doc uh, when you were tagging with uh, Jackie Fulton over there? Because it looked like you guys were having a, a, an awesome time, and it was just good work, solid work between you know those two guys with their heavy set physiques. Obviously, Doctor Death with that All American background, Gordy the big bully heel, and of course you and Jackie put together with the hoods on, great physiques. Uh, those had to be some great times, and, and you had to enjoy those matches. I did. I loved working with Terry, and and I'm like you. I'm a huge Terry Gordy fan. I think he's one of the best, one of the best big men ever. Yep. Uh, everything was everything was believable in the way the way Terry could could sell, and that long hair would fly around, and and he was always grunting and rah, 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 you yep. know growling, and and it, I just I loved it. I loved Terry, and and you're exactly right. He was a, he was a prince of a guy. He was a good guy. He was a soft spoken guy out of the ring. But uh, I thought he was just phenomenal. I thought he was one of the greatest talents I've ever seen. Hey, I watched you work a couple of matches with Stan Hansen. And Stan Hansen, I mean, just by the way y'all are working together, looked like he either took you under his wing or had a lot of respect for you. Because I've seen, I've seen Stan uh, snug a lot of people, and, and I love his work and have a lot of respect for that tough guy that he was. And he, and he could lay it down. I mean, and in Japan, I mean, he's pretty much a god. Uh, what was it like working with Stan Hansen? Because that was one big, strong, I mean, not, not weight strong, but just a big, a bad human being who was extremely tough. He was, and I'm going to tell you something, too. You're exactly right. He wouldn't weight room strong. He didn't get on a treadmill. He didn't get on a stationary bike. But he could go 45 minutes and never draw a deep breath. He was a machine. <laughs> he was a bull in a china shop. He was phenomenal. It was Everything about Stan was entertaining to watch from the moment he stepped through the curtain and fought his way to the ring. And, and I mean, I've, I've seen nights where he just would take that bell, that cowbell and that rope, and he'd flip everybody between him and the ring and just wreak havoc on the way to the ring. But uh, I always got along good with Stan, had a great relationship with Stan, always enjoyed working with Stan, and I felt like I did uh, earn Stan's, Stan's respect. And, of course, I helped Stan uh, in the highest you know, esteem as well. And I'll tell you this, he was the closest thing from a guy gene standpoint. He was the closest thing to Elvis Presley that I think Japan's ever seen. He was, uh, he was godlike over there. I know when you take a guy that that big and bad and call him Elvis Presley like in Japan, I mean that, that's a testament to how over he was. How long did it take you, Dale, to understand uh, the business dynamics uh, of? And I'm not talking uh, dollar numbers, but just as far as uh, making dollars and cents out of the paydays and and how you negotiated uh, against the American style, which some of the, the the pieces were already in place with respect to structured contracts. How long did it take you to bring yourself up to speed? Because it's, at the end of the day, it's about going to the pay window, and I obviously think you have a pretty good sense of that from your trips with Wahoo. Well, I'll tell you another one, and, and just talking about him, I learned a lot from Stan. Uh, my seat was right behind Stan's uh, uh, on that bus that the that the guy jeans traveled on, and I can't tell you, Steve, how many hours I've spent on that bus just talking to Stan and just picking his brain and Listen, if there was anybody that had a, a good sense of 
of of of money and making money and 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 what to expect and and what to demand and what to get. It was Stan. Stan was one of the greatest, and 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 I thank you as well at at protecting their character, at the at developing their character, and using it to their you know greatest benefit. And I learned a lot of that from Stan. And some of it I wished I would have taken to heart. Um, I remember my first tour in Japan as the Patriot. Uh, I'm 285, 290 pounds, and I'm a pretty athletic guy. And I'm doing that Patriot missile off the top turnbuckle, and I jumped up there one night and did a drop kick off the top turnbuckle. And Stan pulled me aside one night, and he said, Hey, man, he said, listen, you're a big guy. You're an athletic guy. He goes, it looks good. He said, but I'm going to tell you, he said, if you do it every night, they're going to want to see it every night. And he said, it'll shorten your career. He said, you need a finish where you don't have to leave your feet, like the lariat, like right. Von Reschke's claw, right. like Wahoo's chop, Dusty's elbow. He said, you need something like that where you can protect your body and preserve your body in your career. And I thought, yeah, right, yeah, whatever, dude. And uh, but he turned out to be prophetic because it was stuff like that that eventually cut my career short. God dang, man! You talk about a guy who's really looking out for you, man. And, and nothing could be further from the he's right on all fronts. And then uh, just to take it uh, first and foremost, he's right. And then on 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 another side of that is pick a finish that anybody can take. You know, if it's a guy that's six ten, six eleven like Taker, or if it's a shorter guy like myself at six one, or even a guy smaller than me, and, and if you get something that's power oriented and you can't get a guy up, it puts yourself in, in a precarious position just as far as being able to deliver that finish. But man, those were words of wisdom. Let's talk about the injuries suffered in the ring because did you come out of football completely unscathed, or, or was there was there a knee injury or shoulder injury in the collegiate level? I had had uh, a shoulder surgery prior to my uh, junior year right. in 83. They laid my shoulder open, and I got a big old scar up there. And then I'd had two ortho- orthoscopic knee surgeries uh, due to football. So that was uh, pretty much, considering how physical the game is and the nature of the game, I felt like I came out of it pretty healthy. But it was the, bit, the wrestling business that just literally uh, <laughs> wreaked havoc on my body. And, and, of course, the injuries were what eventually led to my career ending. But uh, injuries and, and, and things that I'm still paying for today. But I tell you, as tough a game as football is, as violent a game football is, uh, the wrestling business took a greater, far greater toll on my body than football ever did. And, and one of the reasons, Steve, you, you know very well, I, I was there the night that you hurt your neck with Owen is uh, is just the brutal travel schedule and the, the you know night after night in our business there wasn't four or five months off like in football where you can rest and recuperate and your body can heal you know we were expected to be on the road in a different city every night and taking bumps night after night after night and it's tough on your body. Very tough on your body. Man, I always tell people the same thing, Dale. You know, I tell people, hey, man, you, you can't defy the laws of gravity and physics, you know, and you pick somebody up and drop them, there's a mat laying down there. Oh, but that mat's got some give. Oh, it's got a frog's hair give, but at the end of the day, that's a hard surface. And uh, if you just keep spending, uh, you know, day after day, week after week, months and years doing that, it's going to catch up to you down the road. Uh, ultimately, you know, I had to leave the ring and uh, ride off into the sunset. What was, what was the compilation of injuries, major injuries, suffered in the ring that finally led to you having to leave the business? Well, the, the, the first thing was I, I tore my tricep. Um, I literally ripped my tendon off the bone, and it just rolled up. The, as the doctor described it, he said, your tricep has rolled up the back of your arm like an old-fashioned window shade. Yep. And... Uh, I did that in Japan. I drop kicked the guy one night, and I had done that thousands of times. Drop kick, drop kick, drop kick, night after night. And I landed one night, and I just felt something rip and tear, and I had no ability to extend my arm. Excruciating pain. And um, I was in December. I got back home about a week later. I had surgery to repair the the torn tricep. And uh, the doctor said, look, he said, because of your line of work, you need to take about a year off. I mean, if you work behind the desk, you could be back to work in a couple of weeks, but you don't. You're in a very physical form of work, line of work. So to properly heal, you need about a year. And 
you and I know Ooh. we're not taking a year off. Ain't There's no way. Year. No, ain't gonna have no, no money sir. Back. Don't. That's exactly right. So I had the surgery in early January, and uh, I was back in Japan four months later. And uh, I hadn't been back but about a week, and I went to drop a headbutt on a guy. I slammed my sour one night, and I went to drop a headbutt on him, and boom, it ripped again. And uh, oh. and then about a week, about a week later, I blew my right knee out. So that was the beginning of the end for me. I was able to hang on a little bit longer, but that started that process of that thing coming to an end for me. So, uh, what did you do to the knee? Did you blow everything out? Yep, I did. I I, uh, I was working with Crawford and Furnace, and I shot Crawford into a turnbuckle, and I sort of spun around real quick to charge, and, and, and when I planted to go, it just, boom, it gave out on me. And I just collapsed right there in the ring, and I, I couldn't stand up. I couldn't put any pressure on it. As a matter of fact, we still had probably about a week left to go, maybe a little longer on that tour, and they literally took me off the road. They sent me back to Japan, or back to Tokyo, and put me up in a hotel, and uh, Baba was insistent that I work uh, the last night, which was Budokan, mm, wow. and uh, I, w I was in a six-man tag match, and uh, I, I had to have help getting to the ring, and I stood in the corner. I think I got in the ring maybe twice and, and didn't even leave our corner of that area because uh, I'd blown my knee out. So that was, um, I've had that thing replaced twice in the last couple of years. And you know, and this thing going back to uh, you know the drop kick uh, and, and the other move where, where you hurt yourself. It's it's the most simple things sometimes that you do over and over and over again, and boom! All of a sudden, you're going to send a guy on the ropes or just do a, a a reversal. Boom! There goes your knee. You go throw a drop kick. You come down and you try something. It's blown out. And it's just like out of all the things you could do, and I'm, this is what hurts you. And you're thinking, really? I got hurt doing this, and so I always tell people it's it's all the bumps, but sometimes it's the little things that end up getting you, and it doesn't look devastating, but it ends up being devastating. It does, and I'll tell you, Steve, one of the longest nights and one of the most difficult nights of my life was when I had that first tricep surgery to repair that torn tendon, and I took those four months off, and, and I felt like I was ready to go back. I went back way, way too soon. Um, I got back, and like I said, I wasn't back but about a week on the road, about a week over in Japan, and I dropped that headbutt that night, and it tore again. That was a long, long night because reality set in that dude, you're 36 years old, you're, mm -hmm. you're 37 years old, something like that, and you're having problems staying healthy. And I remember I went back to my room that night after they took me to the emergency room and I got shot up with some Demerol and they gave me some pain pills to take back to the room with me. And I didn't want to talk to anybody. Brother, you talk about being down and discouraged and borderline depressed. I just thought, you know, it, it, it's coming to an end. I just it was, right. just a, it was just a long, 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 hard night that night was. It really was. Hey, I'm sitting here talking to Dale Wilkes. The writing's on the wall, but before uh, we get to the writing on the wall, I want to get back to uh, his relationship with God, too. I've got to ask a couple of Doug Furness stories because he's one of my favorite powerlifters of all time. Dale, as you know, uh, Doug was a straight-up dude, one of the strongest human beings that ever walked planet Earth, and this was back in the day, and he was light years ahead of his time and a total freak of nature and an absolute sweetheart of a guy. Uh, what, what was it like to be around that guy and train with him or, or, or just be around him while he's in the gym? Because, again, he's one of the strongest human beings to ever walk the face of the Earth, and he left the uh, sport of powerlifting. Really, at, he could have... He be the all-time greatest powerlifter who ever lived, but he got into the business of pro wrestling after being a running back for the University of Tennessee. He was, uh, Doug was a special guy. He was, he, hands down, the greatest athlete I've ever, I've ever been around. And when I first met Doug on, on my first tour uh, for All Japan, I couldn't stop staring at the guy, Steve, because you know how big his quads were, how big oh. his legs were. And he was just freaky looking. And I thought, man, this can't be real. There's got to be an air valve somewhere where this guy lets his air out of his legs at night. And, uh, but what a phenomenal athlete and what a strong guy. And, uh, but like you said, what a sweetheart of a guy. And, and Doug was, he was a straight up guy. Doug was good at reading other people 
and and figuring out if you were a jerk or if you were straight up or you know if you were full of it and uh, I always felt like that the fact that I could earn Doug's respect and Doug's friendship that meant an awful lot to me I was um, I was honored to be the best man in, in, in Doug's wedding when he and Martha oh, got married and yeah. my wife my wife and I flew out to San Diego and, and she was Martha's maid of honor and I was Doug's best man and they got married there on the beach in San Diego and uh, it was uh, I was telling my wife not long ago there are days that go by when man I just I really really miss Doug he was one of my closest friends I didn't get a chance to be real close to him but of course I was a fan of powerlifting and uh, being a big football fanatic I, I knew what he had done at University of Tennessee and you see that drop kick where he hit a guy you know square in the forehead and just tap him and then damn near cut a flip and come back and land on his feet or whatever. It was uncanny what this guy could do. He was a superhuman uh, and a super nice guy and just a hardworking guy who saved all his money. Uh, Doug wasn't into spending money. And, it, man, it, it was I was real sad uh, to hear a few years ago, uh, you know, when he died. And I, I can't remember, um, uh, Dell what Doug died of. What was it? Well, Doug had... Um and it was a hard thing for Doug to take being the athlete that he was and, and, and someone that prided himself in his ability and his body. But, you know, Doug came down with Parkinson's disease. Right. And um, he battled that for six or seven years. And uh, Doug, and, and this is Doug Furness, the first time I laid eyes on Doug, when I got on the bus, uh, the Gaijin bus, the first time I stepped foot on it, there sat Doug in his seat, and he had a headset on listening to music. And he was in his own little world, and he really didn't, you know, he just stayed to himself. He was quiet, and he listened to that music. But Doug laid down to go to sleep one night. Uh, Steve, he put his headsets on to listen to some music. And uh, the housekeeper came in a few days later and uh, found him. He had died in his sleep from a heart attack. Man, yeah, I'm sorry to hear that guy. Uh, you know, when he when he left the world, he was, he was such a uh, dynamic guy and a real sweetheart. Dale. We talked about the writing on the wall just uh, before the break. You're starting to see it. Uh, are you getting fed up with the business? We're not going to document here, you know, all the territories, all the storylines, what happened here. Let's talk about the writing on the wall, you leaving the business, and you literally, no pun intended, having your come-to-Jesus moment because you accepted Jesus Christ as your life and Savior many years earlier like your parents before you uh, if I'm correct, but strayed so far away from that. What was it ultimately? Let's talk about, let me back up. Let's talk about the writing on the wall, leaving the business, and getting off all these drugs that you're on. Well, at the end, the business had become it become tiresome for me. I, I was like a dog chasing my tail. It just, because of the fact that, that, that I, I hurt, I was in pain, I couldn't do what I once could do physically. I couldn't do things in the ring I once could do. Uh, my physique was starting to change because right. I couldn't train the way I'd always been able to train. And I'm telling you, just that endless cycle of pills, and it just got where, man, I just want off this ride. I just, uh, I just, I need to get away. And it was almost a load off my shoulders when my doctor. I got a call from Vince and Jr. and my orthopedic surgeon had, had talked to him, and he just told him, he said, look, this guy's shot. He just can't continue to go. And um, I had that conversation with Vince and Jr. And, and we all decided that it was just best for me to go get healthy, to have the surgery to repair the knee, to have the surgery to repair the tricep, and get healthy. And, and, and Vince left it with me as Dell, when you get healthy, you're welcome back. Uh, if you want to work on a limited schedule, you can, but you need to get healthy where you can work if you want to. But at that point in time, Steve, that addiction had such a hold on me that I was no good to anybody. I couldn't have gone back to work. I, brother, I couldn't be a good husband. I couldn't be a good father. I couldn't be a good son. I couldn't even be a productive citizen because of the fact that I was breaking the law, uh, calling these prescriptions in. I was just wallowing addiction. I mean, I, my life had just spiraled out of control. So, um, And then when I did have the surgery to repair that tricep tendon, I had a staph infection set up after right. that surgery. 
because they had to go back in and open my arm back up. I mean, just make a six-inch slice on the back of my tricep, and they left it open. He did not close it up. He did not stitch it up. We want this thing to drain to get that infection out, and we want it to heal and just close on its own. And for almost two years, I had an open wound on the back of my arm. It took two years to close all the way. So I was in no shape mentally, physically, psychologically. I was in no shape to, to do anything. Dale, and, what uh, are you doing when it, you got a six-inch uh, slice gash or, so that thing can heal up like you just said? But what do you do to occupy the time? Because I, I'm assuming, first of all, you're probably still heavy on the painkillers. But you know, as far as working and, and doing a job, what do you do? What did you do? Just lay around and take pills all day? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, for about a year and a half, um, I did. I mean, you yeah. know, I had had made good money. I'd made good money, and I, uh, even though I could spend money, I had saved money and invested money and. So uh, for almost probably close to two years, I did nothing except blow money on pills yeah. and, and, and drugs and lawyers because I was getting arrested. And, right. uh, you know, you, you need an attorney to get out of jail and to represent you in court. So I was going, I was going through money at 100 miles an hour. And um, I eventually had a business opportunity open up to me. I, I went in business with another guy, and we, we had a commercial roofing company and we did great business in, in the Columbia area. We had uh, a contract with the CVSs for any CVS that was built in the Columbia area. We put the roof on it and maintained that roof. We also did a couple of malls and we were doing great business, but because of my addiction and because of my habits and because of my bad decisions that I was making, uh, you know, he had to part ways with me. So, uh, you know, eventually uh, it was just, I had alienated everybody because of of the decisions I was making and, and, and the life that I was living. So finally, after forging all these prescriptions, the hammer comes down and, and you get busted. And all of a sudden, uh, you've been in the courtroom many, many times, but you were just able to bond out and go home. But now all of a sudden, what what's, what's the final uh, piece of the puzzle that led to you getting an 18-month sentence uh, that you must do time for? How did that go down and what were you thinking when that judge handed down that sentence, because you ain't never really been locked up for an extended period of time. No, I hadn't. And, and, and just honestly speaking, I think it was probably only because of my name recognition right. in South Carolina in the Columbia area. You know, here's a guy that was a local kid, played high school football here, was an all-state football player, went to South Carolina, was an all-American, you know, uh, a professional wrestler. I think because of that name recognition, I kept getting opportunities that maybe other people wouldn't have gotten. So I would get put on probation, and I would break probation, and they would extend my probation, and I would continue to do what I was doing. I'd continue getting arrested and forging prescriptions, so they'd put me on double secret probation. And, yeah. you know, I had I had to report to the probation officer three times a week. And so I finally, I just quit reporting, man. I just decided, you know, ah, no, nah, I'm not doing this. I'm going to be dirty when I go in. and and they drug test me and, and do a your analysis and so I just quit reporting and, and uh, so they were looking for me and uh, it took them about a month I I was uh, you know hiding out in the buddy's house and, and, and they finally tracked me down and Jesus. Uh, took me back bef took me back before a judge Steve that I'd been been before twice before and uh, I'll never forget it uh, that day on my way to the courtroom I'm thinking I wonder if I'm going to come back today. I wonder, uh, I wrote up with, with a girl I was dating at the time, and I'm thinking, and, and we were talking about it, you know, I hope I can come back with you. I hope that maybe he's going to give me one more chance. But I stood before him that day for the third time that I'd been before him, and he said, Mr. Wilkes, he said, I'd love to put you on probation. He said, I'd love to send you to rehab. He goes, but we've done that on four different occasions. And he said, nothing's worked. Nothing's worked. And he said, I've got no choice but to sentence you to 18 months in the South Carolina Department of Corrections. And I was immediately handcuffed and shackled and let out of a courtroom doing that uh, that shuffle that you do when you got yeah. those shackles around your ankles and, and, of course, around your wrist and was sent to a, a detention center where I stayed there for three weeks until they decided what prison facility they were going to send me to. But uh, that is the rude 
cold hand of reality slapping you upside the face when when the judge takes that gavel and and hits that desk and says, I sentenced you to 18 months in the South Carolina Department of Corrections. Dale, you're a famous cat. You've been all over the world. You're living like a rock star. you got money. You're high most of the time. All of a sudden, that gets yanked from you. And uh, you, you've always been a good human being at your core and in your heart. You got lost along the way. When all of that gets taken from you, I mean, when they slam those doors, let me give you a quick story. I grew up in a town of 5,000 people named Edna, Texas. We went down. We used to always go down to look at what the uh, what kind of shivs and stuff that the, they were taking from the prisoners there in the little county jail. And uh, we would always befriend the cops, and they would come by our house. And they said, hey, do y'all want to get in that jail cell? So me and my brother, Scott and Kevin, got in there, and they shut the door. And, man, when they shut that door, Dell, I knew right then I was probably less than 10 years old that I knew a life of crime was not for me. So I, I haven't been to jail since. Uh, what were the thoughts when you go in there and, mister, you're in jail. I mean, you're in prison. What kind of wake-up call was that? How vulnerable did you feel? I mean, you're a big dude. You can take care of yourself. But all of a sudden, your freedom, your rights as a human being are gone. It is... It's scary. It's intimidating. It's um, it, it shakes you, man. Uh, you know, I, I thought to myself, here I've I've had all this at my fingertips. I've walked down the aisle of some of the most famous venues in the world, and I'm being led out of a courtroom shackled, uh, a convicted felon, mm. and uh, they're, they're putting a, a jumpsuit on me that says South Carolina Department of Corrections down the side of the legs and. Across the back, it says inmate. Ooh. And I remember how in, how embarrassed I was. And when I walked into that detention center where I would stay for three weeks before they decided which prison facility they were going to send me to, it was quite ironic. I thought, I hope I can walk in here and nobody recognize me and nobody know who I am. I grabbed up my cot and I saw a buck in the back corner of that room. It was an open room with just bunk beds stacked everywhere. Right. And I'm trying to trying to get through that crowded room, and nobody recognized me. And I hear somebody go, "Good gracious, it's a patriot!" And I thought, "You've got to be kidding me, man!" I mean, it was humiliating. It yeah. was embarrassing. I mean, just total humiliation that I had allowed my life to get that out of control and to spiral that far down. That here I am. I'm locked up with, you know, thieves, rapists, murderers. I mean, I'm right in there with them. So you found a spot in the back. Uh, you're there. Uh, what are you doing with respect to your drug dependency problem? Because ain't nobody going to hand you 10 to 15 vikes at a time to chew up. What happened? I was fortunate in one sense that by the time I went to uh, court and, and, and was sentenced to those 18 months, I had uh, pretty much weaned myself off the pain pills because – even though I had hopes of coming back down the road that day and not being locked up when I stood before that judge, uh, you know, deep down inside, I knew my chances were very slim of that. So I had pretty much winged myself off. I had to go through some tough, tough times the first couple of weeks as far as just completely cold turkey and off those things. So there were some pretty bad nights, you know, initially, but uh, at least I had some foresight about me to say, hey, look, dude, you better you better make a move here because, you know, chances are I knew when my court date was, and, and I knew there was a high probability that I wasn't going to come back home. So what do you do when you get out of prison? How long were you there? I did uh, just a little over 10 months uh, in the South Carolina Department of Corrections. Yeah. Dude, 10 and, months. Uh, I'm talking about people been there 5, 10, 20 years. 10 months is a lifetime for me. The world has well, been going by, and you're stuck in a damn prison. Unbelievable. So what would you do? I started my life over. I got out uh, Valentine's Day of 2003 and literally had to start my life all over. Uh, my, I lost my family, my wife, my children. I obviously lost my freedom, my finances, and uh, I got out and literally had to start at zero. And I was fortunate that my mother, uh, what a godly woman she is, what a good woman she is, uh, 
had a bedroom that I could stay in. And uh, within three days of getting released, I had a job. I went to work and rebuilt my life over. And it wasn't probably but about a month or two down the road that I was able to get my own home and uh, just rebuild my life. How old were you when you got out of jail, out of prison? I was, I was, if that was in 03, I was 40, I was 42. All right, you're 42. You're 42. You're a convicted felon. You're coming out of prison. You've got to start your life over. You, within a, you got a place with your mom. You got a room there. Uh, shortly thereafter, you land a job. How did you put all the pieces together after that? And, uh, and obviously, just from watching all of your interviews, God was a big part of this. It was, and that was the only way I could do it. You know, there's an old gospel song that says, Where could I go but to the Lord? And when I'm sitting in the jail cell, I was in a prison in Aiken, South Carolina, down near Augusta. And I'm sitting there, and it's just me and and and, and my thoughts. And that was the only place I could go. That was the only place I could turn uh, to get my life in order, to put my life back together. I knew I couldn't do it on my own because, Steve, on my own, I'd made an absolute mess in my life. So it was only through his help and his mercy and his grace that, that he allowed me to put my life back together and allowed me to mend the fences that, that I had torn down and, and to rebuild those relationships with family, friends, children, uh, people that were very dear to me. Well, where are you now in life uh, with respect? You've got, what, two knee replacements. Uh, I know you're a little stove up. You're, you, you're relying on the ibuprofen 800s with respect to controlling some of the pain that you're always going to be in. Uh, how are you right now on a 1 to 10? Where are you health-wise? You're lucky you didn't damage your liver and everything else with as many, and your kidneys with as many pain pills as you were taking. So what is the status of where Dell Wilkes is on just physical being and, and well-being as far as your mental? Well, uh, again, I thank the good Lord that I'm good. Uh, outside of, the, of the, the, the problems, that you know, the orthopedic issues, I, I had a surgery in November. I uh, had my right wrist totally fused. Uh, that was my 15th orthopedic surgery. And uh, I do struggle to get around at times. Uh, some days are pretty tough to get up and down, to walk around, to move around. Uh, but I'm able to cope with it and deal with it through uh, ibuprofen and, and, and things of that nature, but I'm very fortunate that I didn't do any long-term internal damage to myself uh, outside of the orthopedic issues. I, I'm healthy. I, uh, I'd gotten pretty heavy a couple of years ago, uh, but I've lost over 100 pounds, and, and uh, uh, I try to take care of myself through eating healthy and, and uh, taking care of myself that way. So, uh, Overall, I'm I'm in pretty good condition for the condition I'm in. <laughs> yeah, if you'd have known now, if you'd have known back then what you know now, <laughs> I think we would all take better care of ourselves. But uh, I want to just quickly bring up your Twitter account at Dell Wilkes, D E L W I L K E S. It's the real Dell Wilkes. It's the guy I'm talking to right now. Let's talk real quickly. Uh, Del Wilkes, uh, the story of the man behind the mask. And this is a documentary which is being made on your life. And uh, you came on the podcast. You, you're very open. I, I think uh, you would not endorse uh, any collegiate athletes using steroids. You wouldn't recommend uh, mounds and mounds of pain pills, cocaine, and uh, some of the booze on top of that. Life is life. But in this documentary, uh, you're, you're sharing, and, and as you have on the podcast, sharing some of the experiences you've gone through to, to help people avoid some of the pitfalls you've gotten in. Talk about this uh, Kickstarter uh, fund. And if you can put a link on your Twitter account, I know you're not quite as up to technology as I am, and I'm not very far down the road, but talk about this Kickstarter program so that y'all can finish the documentary. I was approached uh, last year uh, by Michael Elliott uh, at Elbow Productions yep. about doing a documentary on my life, uh, my, my entire life, from, from birth to where I'm at today, and wrestling and football and everything in between. And Michael does fabulous work. He's done stuff on Ivan Koloff and the Rock and Roll Express and Magnum PA. And uh, it's not what Michael does for a living. It's a labor of love. And um, I think his wife told him that if he spent another another dime of their money doing this, she was going to kill him. So we started the Kickstarter program and campaign to uh, to finish this off. 
And uh, it's an opportunity for the fans to participate and be a part of what we're doing. And wrestling fans are so great at that. They're the greatest fans on the face of the earth. And to have them donate and participate, and at every level you donate, there are certain prizes and gifts that you get from having your name in the credits to uh, signed masks and signed 8 by 10s and signed flags and things like that. So it's just a great way for them to participate and be a part of that this program and this project along with us. And uh, we appreciate each and every person that has donated and helped us as we complete or come near completing this project. And uh, we look forward to it and think that they're really going to enjoy what they see the finished project. Now, where can they find uh, this website, and can you indeed post a link on your Twitter account? I can hit the retweet button. How can we help you spread the word? Where to find that? Well, the best way is just go to kickstarter.com, and uh, you can link up to that. And um, it will, that's the best way to do it. Uh, you can also go to my Twitter account, at Del Wilkes, as well, and there's a link there also. Uh, now, as you mentioned earlier, I'm not up to speed on a lot of this technology. I've only had my Twitter account maybe a week and a half. But uh, the best way, if you want to be a part of it and you want to uh, contribute to this, is to go to kickstarter.com. Kickstarter.com, you can find it there. Well, uh, I, I know there's uh, there, there's a million other questions I could ask you, but we've been talking for 90 minutes, and that's what the documentary is for, so uh, he ain't got to tell the whole story here, but you get a chance to, to watch the man in action, and you can check out the trailer on YouTube. I've watched it several times. I played it in my open. Uh, it looks very interesting. I'm going to be kicking in because I want to get a, a signed mask from Del Wilkes, the Patriot. Del, I tell you what, I appreciate you being uh, open, honest, candid, uh, I can appreciate the road that you've been down. I appreciate how honest you were uh, with uh, myself and the fans. And I tell you what, I, I've always, uh, I've always, for some reason, uh, respected you. And I just, I thought you was a cool guy. And we didn't get a chance to ride down the road too much. Didn't work uh, a whole lot, or, or or if any. But I always enjoyed your work. And uh, like I said earlier, you, you was a hell of a chameleon because I never knew you had any problems. Uh, and I think it speaks to the, 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 your strength as a human being and obviously now your, your strength and uh, with your faith in the Lord to make a comeback at 42 and be where you're at now at 53. You went down a hell of a road and hopefully through this story, through your documentary, people can learn uh, some of the things from you because, man, uh, life is hard and when you spend a lot of time making mistakes, it makes it even harder. And I think you've learned from those mistakes and are there to uh, hear, to share your story. So I appreciate you being on the show. And obviously, just from one pro wrestler to another, it's always good talking to one of the boys. I appreciate you coming on the show, Dale. Well, Steve, I appreciate you having me on, and I appreciate you giving me the opportunity and the platform to, to talk about my life and my career and also to promote uh, our DVD and uh, all the thanks in the world to you, man. Appreciate it. He is at Dell Wilkes on Twitter. That's the man, and you can follow him. This is Steve Austin. I'm going to come back and wrap up this show. Hey, if you're a runner, if you're a weightlifter, a triathlete, maybe you're into CrossFit or hiking, beach volleyball, maybe you're hitting the beach right now that summer's here, whatever activity you're into, you know that injuries are a fact of life. And if you don't want to slow down for ice therapy, then you need to get Arctic Ease Instant Cold Wraps because you've never experienced anything like Arctic Ease before. It is cold therapy you use while you're still active. So run, bike, lift, and keep your joints and muscles wrapped and cool. Arctic Ease wraps stay in place while giving you similar recovery benefits to ice therapy. And here's a surprising thing. Ain't no freezer needed. Arctic Ease wraps fit comfortably under your clothes with no bulky ice. And they're reusable, too. And they're clinically tested and proven effective. Just put Arctic Ease on and you have targeted instant cold and compression therapy where you need it before, during, and after exercise. For pain, swelling, and injuries, you can safely use Arctic Ease for instant long-lasting cold compression therapy even while you're training. you got to try to believe it. So don't put your training on ice. Get reusable Arctic Ease instant cold wraps at CVS Pharmacy and get instant cooling relief where and when you need it or visit ArcticEase.com.
All right, everybody, give me the go-home cue. It's time to wrap up this podcast and ride off into the sunset. I want to say thank you to Dell Wilkes for joining me today and uh, sharing part of his life story. Check out that documentary, Dell Wilkes, The Man Behind the Mask, and uh, go to that Kickstarter page that he mentioned. If you want to help support the cause, I'm going to help support it myself because I want to see the documentary. Dell is now on Twitter, at Dell Wilkes, D-E-L-W-I-L-K-E-S. Good talking to you, Dale. I'll catch you down the road. I wish you all the best. With that being said, it's time to move on to the word of the day. And the word of the day was supplied by Dale during the conversation. Word of the day is hygiene. Hygiene is the word of the day, not hygiene. That's if you use soap or water trying to wash yourself off a level of cleanliness. I gave you that one for free to make up for some of the ones I didn't give you. Word of the day is hygiene. The definition of hygiene is a Japanese word meaning foreigner. In Japan, it generally refers to Westerners. It doesn't have an insulting implication. So, you know, when people go over there and they're Westerners or like, uh, you know, the boys, we were always the gaijin guys, and that's what it was referred to. Not in an insensitive way, not into uh, an insulting way. That's the word of the day, and that's what it means. And with that being said, man, I'm going to close up shop. Had a fun time talking to Dell. If I get down to his neck of the woods, Redneck Island, maybe I'll get together with him. We can shoot the breeze and have a conversation in person because those in-person conversations are hard to beat. But it was good to talk to the man. I'm glad he's in a good place and weathered the storm that he did. I'll tell you what, taking all them pills, all those painkillers, and doing what he was doing, whew, man, uh, that's a road I have not gone down. But I'll tell you what, he come out on the other side and, uh, took a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of intestinal fortitude to do that. So, but anyway, right here, I just want to say thanks for hitting the download button. I want to say thank you for hitting the subscribe button. If it wasn't for you guys, I wouldn't have a place to vent, a place to talk, a place to shoot the breeze and BS with some of the guys from the business. And sometimes when I don't have anything to talk about, I make up stories about falling down in the shower or rustling flies. But I got to do what I got to do when I need a show. What it do, whatever it takes. Hey, if you want to help support the show and you're shopping on Amazon, if you want to use one of the show links for the Steve Austin Show, it helps us pay our bills for the production costs. And if you want to do that, just go to podcastone.com and you click on the Support Our Show Sponsors banner and then click on the Steve Austin Show. All my great sponsors are there, and all of the Amazon links are there, too, for U.K., Canada, and U.S.A., and you don't get charged anything extra. All it is is if you're going to shop on Amazon and you want to help out the show, that's how you can help us out. Other than that, the show is completely 100% free, and that's thanks to my sponsors, and that's thanks to the Amazon links. Anyway, hit the subscribe button so you never miss a show. There's two separate feeds Family friendly on Tuesday, explicit content on Thursday. Now today's show was a totally, you know, clean conversation, which I'll do that on the uh, Unleashed show when I have a guest that I want to have on the Unleashed show that doesn't cuss, as Dell doesn't. So we kept it clean, but he dropped some heavy 411. But that's what you can expect. Everything but the kitchen sink when you click on that show or when you subscribe to that show. It is explicit content when I have a guest on, and that's the road we go down. Dell and I didn't need to go down that road. He was laying down some heavy information, and it was awesome to hear his story. With that being said, folks, I'm fixed to go out and do my thing. Until next time, my name is Steve Austin, and I will catch your ass down the road. Download new episodes of Steve Austin Unleashed every Thursday at PodcastOne.com. That's PodcastONE.com. Stay tuned for the latest AP News headlines from Podcast One right after this. AP Update, I'm Ross Simpson. The president and the leaders of Southeast Asian nations called today for peaceful resolution of the region's maritime disputes as they concluded a summit in Southern California. President Obama told a news conference that disputes must be resolved by legal means, including a case brought by the Philippines that challenges China's sweeping claims over most of the South China Sea. The United States and ASEAN are reaffirming our strong commitment to a regional order where international rules and norms 
and the rights of all nations, large and small, are upheld. During a question and answer period with reporters, Obama reaffirmed his constitutional right to nominate a successor to the late Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia. There is more than enough time for the Senate to consider in a thoughtful way the record of a nominee that I present uh, and to make a decision. I'm Ross Simpson.